No, I said as I trip over the lights coming up to the microphone. Hi, folks. Um, I'm going to follow uh, one of the threads from uh, earlier this morning to its logical conclusion. If, uh, if the fear of dying is our, our number four biggest fear, then understandably none of us really want to go to funerals. But if public speaking is our number one fear, then if we have to go to a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than give the eulogy. It's one of those statements when you come up and you know that you're live streaming on the internet, you're going to think about that afterward and go, should I really have actually opened with that? <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the things that the mind does and we actually can very much get caught up in thinking, should I have said that, should I have not said that, and, and we can actually get very stuck uh, in, uh, in our difficulties over time, and that's actually very much related to our study. Uh, my name is Stephen Selch and I'm a psychiatrist uh, here in Toronto. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak uh, with all of you and, uh, and we're so appreciative of the grant from the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada and so this is a, is a great forum for me to say thank you uh, for helping us to do this work. Our study is in an early uh, stage and so we're going to tell you about the ideas around our study um, and sort of where we are now. Um, and uh, in particular, we're going to be talking about mindfulness, which is a thing that people are um, starting to hear, uh, I think, more and more about, but many of us in the room may not have uh, heard about this approach. But, uh, so our study is really, uh, our study is not about treating um, brain tumors themselves. It's about how we cope with the very real difficulties and distress uh, that can come with all of that. And I think we heard uh, this morning from Steve and Iris a, a very inspirational story about, uh, about coping with these very real difficulties. And the intent uh, behind our work is to, is to help as many people um, as possible cope as best as possible uh, with that. Um, so to give you some of the background, um, I'm going to introduce a colleague of mine. So, uh, so uh, our colleague that was in your program, Dr. Janet Ellis, very much wanted to be here, and unfortunately, at the last moment, she, she wasn't able to join us. Uh, fortunately, though, um, uh, our research assistant, Ben Diplock, uh, was able to step up, and uh, between me and you, uh, and, uh, and Steve's mom and whoever else is listening at home, uh, ben has really been the, the driving force behind this study. I actually hired Ben for an entirely different study, and, uh, uh, and Ben actually really uh, you know, sought out this grant opportunity, uh, really uh, pushed for this. Uh, there's been a, a driving force behind us applying for it and the application itself, um, and everything that we've uh, been doing since uh, to start recruiting for our study. So it's, a, it's an honor to work with him, and uh, glad to have him talking to you. Come on up, Ben. All righty, so we get the double clock too, there we go, perfect. Um, so folks, once again, Ben Diplock, and uh, I have the honor to work with uh, Dr. Selchin, and once again, thanks for the Brain Tumor Foundation for bringing us all together in a very diverse manner. I think it's great to hear patient stories, it's great to hear different research. Um, like Dr. Selchin said, the work we're doing with survivorship um, and looking at quality of life is very different than the other studies that we just heard of in the research. Nonetheless, this is all extremely important. So um, following that, research basically told us when we started this that, and these are all pretty simple points, right? All things that we all probably know, is that out of you know 70% of the resources that are available to brain tumor survivors, a lot of them don't have information on long-term coping. And that was something that was echoed in the clinic um, that I'm at right now. And, uh, and so that's a bit of an issue. And you know, in spite of the research that is saying that there's a lot of uh, debilitating and difficult sequelae or consequences that come along with this, we also see that you know, there's very little research for coping afterwards. And so that kind of got me thinking as, as, a, as a survivor myself, how can we help other individuals who have overcome the hardest battle and now maybe have more battles to come. And then, you know, we're looking at 80% of central nervous system tumors 
those people want something to help them cope. Um, and I think I, I just want to go back to a comment that was made at the dinner uh, last evening, if you folks had the chance to come. Um, Janet, uh, I asked her if I could point her out, and she said for sure. She brought up the idea of you know mental health as being one of the really important things um, that kind of comes can come after uh, can come after brain tumors and and a lot of other factors in life, a lot of other stressors. So I think that's really important. Um, and I, I applaud Janet for being courageous enough to bring that up. Um, and you know, the, the majority of symptoms that uh, occur after a tumor um, go unnoticed, they go untreated. Um, and like, you know, Janet was mentioning, they, it reduces wellness. Um, and it also increases a burden that individuals and their caregivers experience. I think that's also very important, keeping in mind that it's a massive burden for caregivers to be able to um, deal with new things, novel things with the people they love. Um, and so I think that's important to point out. And, you know, with depression in particular, we're looking at low mood and depression. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there can be a lot of negative outcomes of not treating it early on, right? It can affect, like I have up here, it can affect decision making in terms of initial treatments. It can affect um, detection and, and delay of recovery also. So, so delay of recovery of physical, we talk about immune system, and everything's connected, right? And we're learning that more and more. Um, more hospital stays, uh, substance use to try to help coping, um, and, and a lot of uh, issues with work, things of that nature. And it also really affects quality of life in general. So um, you guys can see up here, there's a bunch of different factors. Um, and these are all factors that occur um, when someone's you know, had a brain tumor, had surgery, had treatment, um, and this can be the result. And these are all stressors. And if you have the support and if you have ways of dealing with this, the outcome can be a lot better. So that got us thinking, you know, this, this stat up on the top, 55,000 brain tumor survivors in Canada, that's a lot, in Canada alone, right? Um, and so kind of my thought was, and, and Dr. Selchin's thought and, and Dr. Ellis as well, was, you know, if, if we're looking at resources that can be helpful long term, what would that be? Um, and now we have a bit of a bias because um, we do work in mindfulness with mental health, but we, I also started looking in the literature and there's been a little work done, but not too much on this area. But mindfulness is helpful in depression and Dr. Selchin is going to talk about that more in particular. So I'll hand the mic back over to him and I'll talk to you guys in a bit. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so mindfulness-based therapies is a therapy that, uh, that basically builds on thousands of years of uh, Eastern meditative practices uh, and uh, not quite as many years of Western psychological uh, and psychotherapeutic uh, interactions. But it's really based on, uh, on how to work with the, uh, the, the suffering that, uh, that many people have uh, in life for various different reasons. Uh, this slide that you're looking at, I'm very proud of, took me half an hour to make. Uh, so that blue circle there represents the, uh, the suffering, uh, the difficulty, the challenge, the unpleasantness um, that happens in life. And some people may feel that their blue circle is larger than, uh, than their fair share and what have you. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to make too many circles because I'd confuse myself. But so that's a fact of of uh, you know encountering um, difficulty in life uh, is this a certain measure of distress and challenge, and then the human mind has this quirky thing that it sometimes does, which is no matter how big and how difficult our distress is and our challenges in life are, no matter how big they are, the mind has this way of making them even worse sometimes by the ways that we interact with it, by the ways that we ruminate about it and spin in our minds about it, by the ways that we worry about things that we don't have a lot of control about, by the ways we turn on ourselves and beat ourselves up for things that aren't really our fault. And, and so how we can yeah, you see, you see that effect? You see the red circle go around there? So that red circle is all of the extra distress that we add on top 
of the difficulty that's already there for us um, and how we snowball our challenges and, and unfortunately make them uh, worse and worse by accident uh, often. And so mindfulness really focuses on that extra distress that we accidentally add in the face of the challenges that we already had, which were big enough already, as, uh, as I don't have to tell you. And so if we can pull back that extra layer of, of, of difficulty and challenge and distress, we're still left with the very real problems and challenges that we have, but we might have more time and energy and resource to be able to work with them. And also to show up for some of the other pleasant uh, things that may be here in our lives that we're missing because we're so caught up in this struggle with the difficulty. And that's sort of the, that's the principle um, of, uh, of how we work uh, in mindfulness. And what does that actually mean? We're cultivating an awareness um, through sort of meditative practices and other kinds of exercises where we start to pay attention to our experiences on purpose in a very intentional way because a lot of how we get stuck in things uh, happens in a very automatic, habitual way. Uh, we start paying attention to what's right here in the present because a, not that the past and the future, uh, not that we're going to avoid those, but a lot of our difficulty, again, gets generated when we get stuck worrying about uh, the future or going over the past over and over again. And we're going to also le we learn to pay attention to our experiences without getting so caught up in judgment and criticism of ourselves or, or, or others and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so we bring these practices together. We teach this in a group format, and this is one of the reasons why uh, we thought this may be particularly helpful. Not only are there uh, group therapeutic factors of, of people with similar uh, challenges being together in a group, uh, but it also creates a, a more efficient way of providing treatment so we can reach as many people as possible. It's a structured program. Um, it feels very much in some ways like a psychoeducational class. We're learning about how our own minds work through direct experience and, and discussion. We focus on uh, the ways that our minds get stuck in distress um, and how to learn uh, to not get so stuck and how to respond more effectively to what's going on. We use a number of meditations and we use daily practice as well. So we learn to pay attention to how we, to, to the sensations of, eating and the sensations in our bodies, we pay attention to our breath, we pay attention to sensations of the body and movement, we learn to pay attention to our thoughts and our emotions and, and to get to know them and how we get stuck in them and how we can respond more effectively to them. And we learn very brief meditations as well that we can do at any time in any place uh, just for a moment or two as a way of uh, reorienting us. So we bring attention and intention, we become uh, more present with our experiences, we offer curiosity for some of our difficulties, we learn to really recognize our thoughts as thoughts, we don't have to take all of them so seriously, especially the ones that are treating us so harshly, uh, which builds a kind of self-compassion, we learn to turn toward our difficulties so that we can work with them more effectively, we learn to allow some of the things that we don't have control over and focus on the things that we do, and we learn to respond to what's going on instead of getting so caught up in some of uh, the reactivity that adds to more distress. I'm not going to go through these slides, but just to show you there's a, a history of mindfulness being effective um, in, for example, the treatment um, of depression and being uh, on par with medication in some ways and having meaningful changes uh, in the brain as we learn these practices. And so what there isn't, so now at this point there's robust evidence for mindfulness treating anxiety and depression and, uh, and stress and all kinds of things and uh, having a positive impact on the healthcare system uh, and being cost effective, but there hasn't been a lot of uh, mindfulness research in this particular area, people coping with, uh, with brain tumors. And so that's really what we wanted to apply this to. And so in the last couple of minutes, Ben's just going to take us uh, through where we're at right now in our study. Um, so, just because I know time is, time is limited and we want to get the questions, I'm going to go through this really quick, but we really want to see our hypothesis is, can an eight-week program that we've used for depression, anxiety that's been used in other areas of research, can it be effective to help with reducing depressive symptoms, to help with perceived stress, quali improve quality of life, and also mental well-being for 
um, patients. And so right now I'm embedded in the clinic and have the honor of having uh, at least one of our, one of our team members um, additionally uh, to, to Dr. Salchin added on here. And, and so uh, being here in, uh, with us today. So we're in the clinic, we're recruiting patients. Um, and basically we go in and, and talk with the patients. We have a way of, of kind of looking at their eligibility and seeing if they have low mood, um, if they're feeling a bit down. Um, and basically, um, if they're one year post-treatment, that's one of the way that we kind of decipher whether they'll be eligible. And then there's another, uh, another other processes that we look through. So basically, um, there's an intake session with Dr. Selchin. He explains a bit more about mindfulness, um, tells him a bit more information. Um, and there's a lot of clinical judgment that uh, goes in place. So the, the, uh, the amazing rad onks, the radiation oncologists, neurologists in the clinic, social workers, uh, registered nurses, uh, they help us screen to see which patients might be good for this and which patient, patients might benefit from this treatment. Um, and then if they're eligible, they are, are either randomized to one of two groups. So the waitlist control or the, uh, the active treatment. And what I say to patients, and this is my number one important thing, is that there's no placebo effect. We wanna make sure that everyone in this, uh, in this uh, study gets something out of this. So it just means the one group has to wait a bit longer, but they'll get the exact same thing. Um, and I think this study is, is powerful because it's randomized, which means it's scientifically rigorous, but it also gets people what they want. And I think that's, why we're all here, right? We're all here to make lives better. So um, our, our first group should be scheduled in, in early January and we're continuing to recruit. And uh, really just uh, from both Dr. Selch and I, really want to thank you guys for the time and the opportunity to share. Thank you.